All right, once again, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have a wonderful presentation for you. Dr. Matosian is, is looking forward to, to answering all your questions. And we also have Tracy Puckett from Peer Lab and Maya Sherbert from Marco on the call as well. So if you have any questions regarding any of the products that are talked about in this presentation, we uh, can get those answered for you as well. So once again, we have Dr. Cynthia Matosian on as our featured presenter. Dr. Matosian is the founder and CEO of Matosian Eye Associates, which is an integrated multi-specialty ophthalmology and optometry practice serving Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and Mercy, Mercer County, New Jersey, since 1987. She specializes in cataract surgery with advanced technology implants. Dr. Matosian, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much for being a part of this uh, presentation. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It is my um, delight to be talking about this subject on preoperative assessment and surgical planning for successful IOL pairing. This is a topic that's really passionate to me. So it's something I do with all of my patients, and I am very happy that I can share some of my thoughts with all of you. I really encourage questions, so as you think of one, go ahead and type it in the message space, and we'll get a chance to address them, like um, Aaron said at the end of this presentation. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. Um, actually, our patients judge us by our surgical outcomes, and nowadays, through internet and all sorts of social media, a lot of patients compare notes. So if you want good outcomes, one of my big strong points is make sure that you're picking the right implant for that patient. You could do flawless surgery, but the surgical outcome may be suboptimal if the implant choice wasn't the right one to begin with. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Let's go to the next slide, please. So key to success is matching the correct implant to every patient. And sometimes I tell my patients they may even end up with a different implant in each one of their eyes. Next slide. The first kind of take-home message from this webinar, I hope for all of you, will be to decouple the cataract consult from the surgical testing appointment. Um, and the reasons why. I mean, if you think about it, and it took me a while to come to this decision, it's at the time of the cataract consult, or let's say a comprehensive consult, when the doctor and the patient have made an agreement that, yes, the cataract is visually significant and requires surgery. If at that point you take the patient and begin doing your preoperative testing, you may end up with some incorrect information. And why is that? Because at the time of the cataract consult, what's happened to that eye? The patient has been staring into a bunch of equipment. They probably have not been blinking regularly. They've had applination tonometry done. They've had a variety of drops instilled into their eye. So their tear film and cornea may not be as healthy as when they walked into the office. So you're going to get more accurate measurements, especially for your K readings and topography readings, if they come back and they're tested um, once their eyes have not been at all um, interfered with. The second point why I've started going to this um, two-appointment system is that when the patient commits to cataract surgery, they're nervous as it is because eye surgery is a very scary thought for them. And for them to also commit to a type of implant may just be too overwhelming for them to commit to out-of-payment, um, out-of-pocket payment when they are maybe not as well prepared to make that decision. 
potentially they are not as well educated about that topic as they would like to be by looking it up on the Internet or talking to family members or family. So by giving them time and helping them get educated, when they come back, they'll be in a much better position to make an educated decision. And lastly, we have found that there's better schedule and patient management when we separate these two appointments. At our office, we run two parallel appointments. I have one column, that's my regular patient, and I have one column that are all of my preoperative testing patients. So we go back and forth, and this way our patients and our schedules are very well under control. Next slide, please. So I've broken this webinar down into two halves. The first part is what we do during the cataract consult segment of our appointment, and then the second part will be what we do when the patients come back for their preoperative testing. So during the cataract consult, while the patients are dilating, and I have not seen them yet, they watch eye imagination. I'm sure some of you have this. It's an amazing tool. It helps educate our patients with the basics of their anatomy, their cataracts. It introduces them to different terminology like toric and presbyopia correcting, phaco, and things like that. So when I come into the room, I'm not starting at square one. That helps me, and that helps the patient because they now have a basic background, and I can start the conversation much further down the road. Once I'm in the room, one of the first things I do is have a very specific questionnaire, which I'm going to share with you in a moment, so I can better understand the patient's needs and therefore be able to best select or best customize the implant for them. During the cataract consult, we also assess and treat their ocular surface issues. We do an OCT. We schedule all of their appointments for surgery and their post-op visits, and I'll go into this in more detail shortly, and then the surgical coordinator assigns them homework. So with that, we'll go to the second bullet, the questionnaire. Erin, you can just click on the questionnaire. It should open it. There we go. This is pretty uh, on purpose, this is um, a busy slide, and I did that because you can personalize your own questionnaire any way you want to. So what I want to know from my patients are the following, and these are just some things. You, we can go to the next slide. The first thing I want to know is what are their hobbies and what do they do? Because somebody who's a cross-country truck driver is going to have very different needs after cataract surgery than somebody who stares at a computer monitor all day. So this gives me an opportunity to interact with my patients and really understand what it is they do and what it is that they want to get out of their cataract surgery. Next slide, please. I also always ask, have you had other surgeries? Obviously, I know if they've had it, this is just a reminder for them, because this sets the expectation for our post-LASIK patients. As all of us know, it is very difficult to nail down the post-operative refraction in post-LASIK patients after cataract surgery. So by asking them this, I discuss this topic with them, and I let them know that after LASIK, we may have to do additional procedures to get them to where they want to be. Again, this is setting the expectations so the patients are not surprised if you're a little bit off than your goal. With our RK patients, they know they have fluctuating vision. I actually take time explaining this to them again, reminding them of it, and we bring our RK patients in in the morning and then on a later day, maybe a week or two later, we bring them in in a late afternoon appointment and we measure the amount of changes there are to their cornea. This way we're engaging the patient in understanding that they're still going to have issues 
even after cataract surgery. Next slide, please. Now, I also asked my patients how much driving they would like to do at night. It's surprising how many older patients drive all night to Florida, for example. So that needs to be taken into consideration if you're considering a multifocal implant. I also want to know if they are on flu max or related medications. This group here represents similar meds to Flomax, and of course, if they are on some of these medications, including prostate vitamins, they may have IFIS issues in, intraoperatively, and so you may want to order a Melumin ring or iris retractor, whatever you're comfortable with, ahead of time. So this way, you're prepared for whatever you may encounter in the OR. Next slide. Under other comments, this is where I might put, you know, need Malugan rain, possible vision blue, and also this is where I put possible vitrectomy. If it's a traumatic cataract, if it's a cataract where I see some phacodenesis, even if it could be very mild at the slit lamp, there is a higher risk that this patient may need a vitrectomy. If it's somebody with very bad zonulopathy from pseudoexfoliation, potentially vitreous may prolapse in an area where there's zonular dialysis. So this is where I actually put possible vitrectomy. We add it to the consent. I talk to the patient about it. We add it to our surgical schedule. So again, there's no question the OR and the patient know about it ahead of time. Next slide. Then I start to assess the ocular surface. In our office, we do tear osmolarity, and Trace is here from Tear Lab if any of you have questions as we go down the road. That helps me get a number, and we follow these numbers over time, and the patients really like that, so they have something concrete to hang their hat on. I do lysamine green dye staining on all of my pre-cataract patients. And this actually has opened up a whole new world for me. I used to only do fluorescein staining. And now with lysamine green, I'm seeing how much conjunctival uptake there is with lysamine green and also how disease the eyelid margin is. And some people call that eyelid... Um, margin epitheliopathy or lead wiper epitheliopathy. So depending on what I see, I'll obviously implement a different treatment regimen for these patients. Also, the last bullet is a really, really important one. In patients who wear soft contact lenses, they have to leave their contact valve at least two weeks or you're going to get incorrect information and for our RGP wearers, it's a minimum of four weeks or until their K reading stabilize. Next slide, please. So the American Academy of Ophthalmology has actually listed tear osmolarity among its preferred practice patterns. And we have a short video that's going to show you how simple this test is to do. Our techs do it on a regular basis. So, Erin, if we can run the video, please. And the techs check a very, take a very small amount of tears, just like that, from the tear meniscus, and we have a range. Anything over 290 is considered abnormal. Anything below 290 is considered normal. It literally takes a second to do, just like this video shows, and we have a test strip in the room, and we go ahead and use one test strip per each eye. It's very simple and pain-free. Next slide, please. Tear osmolarity also has a very high PPV value, and PPV stands for positive predictive value, Compared to the other clinical tests like Schirmer's, tear breakup time, et cetera, um, tear osmolarity is at 87%. Next slide, please. So depending on 
on the level of their ocular surface disease, I initiate artificial tear, preservative-free, only preservative-free QID between the time I see them and when they come back for their biometry or surgical testing appointment. 100% of patients get the first bullet. And the reason we do this is to optimize their surface and to help them learn how to put artificial tears in their eye. This way they develop their skill set, they're comfortable coming close to their eyes, and are able to put drops in much more accurately when we change the tears to their preoperative medication. Now, if they have worse ocular surface disease, I might choose any of the other bullets, omega-3 oral supplements, cyclosporin, azithromycin, lodopredinol ointment, or even lodopredinol gel. Next slide, please. Now, this is Eric Donenfeld's um, slide, and he's showing how the uh, topography looked in a patient who had ocular surface disease before and after cyclosporine treatment. And had they not optimized the surface in this patient and based their measurements on the first topography, they may have been surprised with a post-refractive outcome that was not intended. So it's critically important to do all that you can, get the ocular surface as healthy as possible, then bring the patients back for their measurements. Next slide, please. Now, we do an OCT to rule out posterior pole issues. Sometimes very small, thin epiretinal membranes may be hard to see, especially through dense cataracts. Sometimes a vitreal macular traction may be very difficult to see. So if I see any abnormalities on OCT, if warranted, we send them to our retina colleagues. This way the patients will remember, yes, there was something not right with the back of my eye. I had to see a specialist. And, of course, that's going to help me make a decision as to whether to consider a multifocal implant or not. Next slide, please. Now, after all these tests have been done, we're still on the cataract consult appointment. The patient now goes to see our surgical coordinator. They answer any remaining questions that our patients have. They schedule their biometry appointment a minimum of two weeks out or longer, depending on the level of their ocular surface disease. They schedule the surgery dates for their two eyes, and they schedule all of their post-operative appointments. So these patients may end up with six or seven appointments, and we do this so that they have time to prepare for their transportation. We don't want them missing their post-operative visits or canceling out at the last minute. So by having this amount of time, they are able to find transportation and take time off or whatever it may be so we have very, very few no-shows or reschedules for our post-op appointment. And we also email all of our patients, um, as long as they have an email address and are willing to e share their email address with us, an echo module through iImagination of cataract-related vignettes. These include... Um, information about different types of implants, again, cataract surgery. This way the patients have the time to watch these uh, eye imagination vignettes in the privacy of their home. They can share it through social media with their family and friends, and they have time to digest this information. And for our patients who don't have email, we hand them pamphlets and brochures and even if people have an email but want the brochures, we, of course, share those with them as well. This way they have the paper version and the email module. And they, we encourage them to read it. And this is, quote, unquote, their homework. So when they come back, they're better educated because this is what we talk about at their biometry appointment. Next slide, please. So now I'm 
minimum of two weeks or more go by, the patients are using preservative-free artificial tears QID or more, and now they're here for their pre-surgical test. And this is what happens on that day. Next slide, please. The very first thing we do is keratometry. We have a dedicated manual keratometer in each office for just cataract surgery. It's calibrated daily, and we log the calibration. And only two of our most senior techs are allowed to do manual case preoperatively. So we do that. Then we do case through Iowa Master or Lenstar. We do case through topography, and we use the NIDEC OPD3, and we do autorefractor case. Then I look at the case, and if there's a discrepancy in the axis, more than about 10 degrees, or in the amount of overall astigmatism, let's say more than half a diopter, that's a red flag for me, and I have to delve into the patient's chart more deeply to try to figure out what's going on. Obviously, the K numbers for the flat and the steep meridians will not be the same because we're using different machines, and each machine calibrates it and calculates it and measures it differently but the overall amount of astigmatism should be very similar between the machines. Then we do optical biometry, and if we have any trouble, because it's a dense PSD cataract or for whatever reason, our techs know to go directly to immersion, and our techs are advanced enough to do immersion very accurately. Next slide, please. Then we do the OPD3 topography. I love this instrument because it gives me so much information. Let's look at the next one. Not only do you have to look at the overall amount of astigmatism, but it's critically important to look at the pattern of the astigmatism. So in this slide, we can look at the top line, metal slide. It says axial and you can see a beautifully symmetrical bow tie pattern. I actually show this slide to my patient on a large monitor and show them, quote, unquote, their astigmatism. So for the first time, they can see what astigmatism is on their eye. And this way, they may better understand why a toric implant may be the ideal choice for them. Then let's look at the middle bottom row, and it's, it says PSF. That stands for point spread function. I actually show this slide to my patients as well. And I say, this is what you see when you look at an oncoming source of light. After cataract surgery, you're going to see the next slide to the right of it, depending on how you're sitting. And that's point spread function HO. That stands for higher order, and that's a residual higher order point spread function that's residual after cataract surgery that we can't do anything about. So I let them know there'll be a big improvement, but yet a point source of light will still have a little bit of feathering to it. And ever since I've started saying this and demonstrating it to our patients, I don't get complaints anymore that oncoming headlights or street lamps are not a perfect dot because this is a residual higher order and they understand that there's no treatment for that. Next slide, please. Now, this is another OPD slide, and this person has a very symmetrical, beautiful, horizontal bow tie. Again, this person will do very well with a toric IOL. Again, if you look at the point spread function total, meaning with a cataract in place, and higher order, meaning the residual, after the cataract is gone, there's a dramatic difference. But again, there's some feathering of that, of that um, light, and the patients totally understand that. Next slide, please. Now, this slide um, shows what I call a pseudo-bow tie. 
Now, obviously, I don't see you, so I can't do a show of hands, but I want to ask you out there, um, how many of you would consider this a symmetrical bow tie? I have all of you who would say no. And how many of you would consider putting a toric IOL in? And I hope most of you or all of you would say no to that question. And actually, this was a patient referred to me because her ophthalmologist um, thought this was a symmetrical bow tie and implanted a toric IOL in this patient. And it turned out that this patient was a soft contact lens wearer and had not been told to take the contact lenses out prior to her measurement. So this is a pseudo-astigmatism from her contact lens that completely resolved once we left her contacts out and optimized her surface, but now she had a toric implant in there, which she didn't need. So actually, I had to explant her toric implant, and she did beautifully with a monofocal implant. So the moral of the story is make sure your patients leave their contact lenses out. Next slide, please. I also review angle kappa with every one of my patients. Next slide, please. Now, what is angle kappa? Angle kappa is the difference between the anatomical center of the pupil and the patient's visual center. Let's look at the middle map that says mesopic at the top of it. And you can see where the blue and the red lines cross, and they're intersecting at the patient's visual axis. And that is decentered from the patient's anatomical center, which are represented by the two tiny crosses in aqua and kind of fuchsia in the center of the pupil. One is the photopic pupil, that's the magenta, and the mesopic is the aqua. So you can see there's a big difference. And if you look below under pupil information, and we're still on the middle map, you see that under photopic, the angle kappa in this patient is 0 0.77. And in mesopic, the angle kappa is 0 0.66. My cutoff is 0 0.44, 0 0.40, actually. So anybody who has a larger angle kappa than 0 0.40, um, I don't recommend a multifocal IOL. Next slide, please. This is another beautiful view of a positive angle kappa. You see the visual axis in this patient is decentered nasally because this is the right eye relative to the anatomic center of the pupil. And his or her angle kappa is 0 0.74 and 0 0.77. So in my view, my opinion is this patient should not get a multifocal implant. I will probably recommend a crystal lens but definitely not a multifocal. Next slide, please. Then what I do is I show my patients their dry eye. This has been such an eye-opener for me, and my patients now totally understand kind of why they've been feeling so miserable with their gritty, sandy, grainy sensation. Next slide, please. We take a placido disc film of the ocular surface, and the more irregular it is, the worse the situation. Obviously, you can pick up pterygia this way, you can pick up corneal scars this way, but if the patient has an unhealthy epithelium, these placido discs are going to be warped and abnormal just like in this slide. So when patients see this, they totally now get what dry eye means. And this way they know that this is a situation that's pre-existing. You know what the adage is, if you tell them before cataract surgery, it's considered, considered a pre-existing pre condition. Whereas if you let them know about it after cataract surgery, Either the patient will blame you for giving it to them, 
or they'll totally believe it's the cataract surgery that gave them their issue, whether it's dry eye or macular degeneration. That's why by documenting this and discussing this with them ahead of time, they know it's a pre-existing condition. Moreover, once they see how abnormal their, their procedure disc circles are, my patients have become more adherent with their dry eye treatment regimen. They know they want to make this better, and so they're much more reliant about using their Restasis or their omega-3 oral supplements or their artificial tears or whatever it is that you may be prescribing them. And then we, we repeat this test at a later date, and they can see how much of an improvement they've gotten. I also tell them dry eye disease is chronic, and they're going to continue with it, and it may even get worse over time. And it is not cataract surgery that's giving them that they're dry eye. Next slide, please. Now, this is Bill Trattler's slide, and this is a very interesting one. And this kind of brings home all the things we've been discussing so far. This is a patient he was referred for a consultation for a presbyopia correcting implant. So they did the topography measurement, and based on the topography measurement and the case, they would have selected a Texas multifocal plus 20 for a refractive outcome of a minus 0.11, as you can see. But fortunately, they decided to treat the ocular surface first. Next slide, please. So after they treated the ocular surface, the case changed, the surface changed, and now the implant power is not 20 anymore, it's 21. Next slide, please. So had they stuck with the first one and selected a 20, the patient would have had a one diopter refractive surprise with a tetanus multifocal. Now, you and I know this patient would not have been a happy person. So, again, this demonstrates the critically important role of optimizing the ocular surface, bringing the patient back, redoing the measurement, and then basing your implant calculations on the healthier cornea number. Next slide, please. So now you are in the room with a patient. You're going to interpret all the data and come up with a recommendation for the patient. You have to analyze the patient's entire ocular situation, including their hobbies that you documented and, and discussed with the patient, their driving preferences. You have to take into consideration the patient's um, responses to the questionnaire that they filled out. How motivated are they to be less dependent on their spectacle? I never say spectacle-free. I always say less dependent on glasses. You have to take into consideration their ocular history. Do they have amblyopia? Do they have strabismus? Are they wearing prism in their glasses? Because certainly that patient is not going to be less dependent on their glasses. You have to take into consideration their ocular surface and make sure they understand that. You have to review their astigmatism pattern. So it's not just the amount of astigmatism. It's the symmetry or asymmetry of it. Do they have keratoconus? Do they have pellucid degeneration? You have to interpret the OPD data with their annual kappa, and you have to maintain what the OCT showed you and reminded you. Do they have posterior pulpathology? Do they have macular drusen? So based on all of this information that you're now integrating into your decision-making process, I recommend two implants for each one of my patients. Next slide, please. Now, studies show that if you give them too many options, 
again, the patients get overwhelmed. They don't have enough information to sort through all that data, and they do the simplest thing, which is pick the most basic one. I always give them two options. I tell them the standard comes with their insurance. I don't say anything negative about it. I just let them know they'll be wearing glasses 100% of the time. And I always give them an advanced technology choice that requires an out-of-pocket payment, whether it's an LRI for a small amount of astigmatism. My cutoff is around 1.25 to about 1.5 diopters. Anything over that, as long as it's symmetrical, I recommend it to work. So there's always a standard and an advanced technology implant. It could be a multifocal, an accommodative, blended vision, where I do a mini mono between the dominant and the non-dominant eyes. And, of course, we go over the pros and cons, the risks and benefits of each of the two options. Next slide, please. In order for you to get the best results, you have to personalize your A constant. If you're not sure how to do it, certainly talk to your rep. They'll help you. You can get on Dr. Warren Hill's website, and he'll help you through it. You have to personalize your surgically induced astigmatism. This is also really, really important because that's how you know how to best correct for cylinder, whether it's with an LRI or a toric implant. And you have to use um, proper IOL formulas to make sure you're getting the best surgical outcome. Now, once you give the patients two options, you've given them time to digest the information, they've had time to learn about it, you've sent them videos, you've given them pamphlets, they've had an opportunity to discuss it with their family, and we always encourage our patients to bring a family member to their surgical testing appointment. Now the patients feel comfortable, they're not overwhelmed to make a decision between the standard and the more advanced technology option or one that requires an out-of-pocket payment. So our conversion rates as a result are very high because of all of these factors. Next slide, please. And based on that, you're going to have happy patients who are ambassadors of goodwill. Next slide. And with that, I say a big thank you. So now we can open up the discussion, the webinar, to all of your questions. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Tosian. Do you have a question already? So question is, is why not use a toric for one to one and a half diopters of cylinder instead of LRI? If the patient is interested in presbyopia correcting, then I may offer them a multifocal or a crystalline and do an LRI up to 1.25 or 1.5 diopters. If the patient is not interested in presbyopia correcting, I usually recommend a toric implant for a cylinder of one diopter or more. Because usually a toric implant is much more predictable and we get better outcomes than doing an LOI. I hope that answers your question. Your question, I should say. Well, thank you. And we also have Maya and Tracy here in case you have questions on Tear Lab, Tear Osmolarity, or the OPD3 NIDAC unit. Yes, exactly. Again, if you think of any, you can definitely email marketing at imaginations.com or import imaginations.com and I can get your questions forwarded over to the appropriate person. So again, thank you, Dr. Matosian. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. And everybody have a great evening. Thank you.